let's turn to segment seven. This looks like a change. This looks like something that is totally different from what we've done so far. And that is, um, we have been dealing with more processes of learning, with a critique of learning, with a critique of teaching, of the institution. Uh, so how does qualitative inquiry, uh, a course that I have developed over the last 20 years, and uh, the, the also a course that I'm proud of, um, but it is something that is more a content thing, so to speak. Um, Okay, let me start briefly with a little bit of uh, what typically happens. Qualitative, when I started teaching here in, in uh, uh, Zhongguo, China, it was new to students. But it is new to students almost wherever I teach this course. Uh, in Germany, in uh, the United States, my students, they have heard of it and they think it's not quantitative. That's what they take away at the very beginning. Um, but then, very quickly, they realize there's a lot more than not having any numbers to count or doing any statistics. Yeah? Um, some also realize that, uh, or uh, have heard, that it is opposed to the experimental method, uh, the so-called hypothetical deductive method. Yeah? Um, People who run experiments, people who do quantitative work with questionnaires, for instance, um, they try to generalize across larger populations. Um, and they have a particular hypothesis in mind that they put into the questionnaire or into the experimental design. And then, hopefully, the hypothesis is being confirmed or it is not confirmed. Yeah? And there are ways methods to do this right, um, to work with a hypothesis, test it out, and see the result. And qualitative looks different, and it also is somewhat different. But some people have concluded from that, ah, it is not top-down with a hypothesis, but it is bottom-up, inductive. So looking at a lot of data, and, or some data, or very few data, and getting some more in-depth understanding. Again, this is not wrong, but there's a lot more to it. But qualitative uh, is a new, it is an old, but uh, in the way it is being taught, it is a new way of doing inquiry, uh, in the academic institutions at least. And it also makes the processes of learning a lot more transparent. So and that's something that I want to focus on. So we are in segment seven, and we have moved from uh, the processes and a, um, a laying out of what kind of processes may enhance deeper, better, more productive learning, now into a content area of qualitative. And the question is, for this segment, what is qualitative and why do we need it? Now, we want to connect it, and this will be a little bit of a challenge, to what we have started with, uh, and that is we would like our students at the end to be closer to the real world, to the challenges that are out there, outside the classrooms. We want them to be engaged in project work, connected to the real world, and work in collaborative groups. We also want to get them, uh, we want them to get a sense for these habits of li li uh, lifelong learning. So not learning for the grade or the classroom or the degree, but getting a sense that learning is an ongoing process in everybody's life. So uh, in addition then we added uh, some other learning objectives like managing complexity, managing uncertainty, and also uh, being able to work with and managing change. And that's where we had at the very earlier segments the term of divergent thinking and frame-breaking, being innovative, being creative, 
yeah, and also setting the learner up for failure so that we learn from mistakes. Collaboration, we had that, and working with our differences rather than our commonalities. So these are the kinds of things qualitative has to be connected to. So let us try. So I picked out four focal points. Uh, now this is my kind of definition of qualitative. Um, usually I'm not at the very beginning of the qualitative class, I'm not giving a definition. I'm not giving my viewpoint of what qualitative is and what it is go good for. I'll go through this, these four in a second. Um, and this is the first time that I thought, okay, I can just help you do it, learning it by yourself. I need to give you the kinds of focal points that I think are most relevant. And it's interesting, I realize that my focal points are not those of my best friends and colleagues in the field. They have some other focal points. And that's interesting and telling also for how we try to break into this field of qualitative inquiry. I'll get there in a second of what it could be. Um, the other thing is not starting with a definition and assisting the student, the learner, in coming up with their own understanding, their own definition, is much more important. Yeah, if they have an understanding, an understanding that is not the one that I would have liked to, to see in a, in a learner, but it is something that they are working with, that is enough at the end of a course. If they can show and demonstrate that their understanding leads them to a particular product, I'm happy. Yeah, my little instructor heart again is boom, 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 happy. All right, so this is just about the problems of giving a clear definition. But here are four important points. The first one is about the other. It's not about me. It's not a method where I can find with introspection, for instance, what is going on, what is relevant, why I do what I do. This is about the other, about other people in particular, but it has ramifications on the researcher. Yeah, so we'll get there. The second very important point, to me at least, is it is contextual. Uh, uh, I will try to flash that out a little bit, uh, that context is the most important part in qualitative inquiry. Uh, I've come to the conviction that what we are doing is not really investigating people, but contexts within which people work, function, say things, think, do things, act. Yeah, But the context becomes the unit of analysis, the focal point for what we are interested in. This may sound very abstract at this point. The, th the, th the third um, focal characteristic of qualitative is difference. Um, yeah, we are deeply interested in differences, um, in differences between the researcher and the other, between people and also even when we have the same person in different situations, yeah, we are interested in what they are doing differently. Now this is in contrast to other research that is interested in commonalities, what people have in common, up to the point of what is universal. How about that? And the fourth important point is agency. People as meaning-making agents. Yeah? The other, they know what they do. They may not know what they do, but they know what they do. More about that in a second. So, let's focus for a couple of minutes uh, on the other. The other is the focal point in this type of qualitative inquiry. Yeah? This is where the term subjectivity 
the experience of the other becomes central. We are interested in where people, metaphorically speaking, come from, their background, leading us ultimately to some better understanding of what is it that they are doing, what is it that they are thinking, what is it that they are saying, why do they say what they say, why do they think what they think, and why do they do what they do. Yeah? In this field, we start with the assumption we have no idea why people do what they do. Yeah? There is no direct reason. Yeah? We always make interpretive assumptions. Um, when somebody smiles, we think oh, they are happy or they just hurt something. When somebody looks away, we think, oh, they are trying to avoid eye contact. So we jump to a lot of conclusions in all kinds of situations. But there is no certainty. And this is particularly when we try to begin to analyze actions of people and interactions. Yeah? And for some of you, this may be highly relevant when it comes to verbal interactions, when it comes to negotiations, when it comes to business negotiations. What is going on? How can we make sense of misunderstandings? Okay, now this is very specific. I'm going to stay a little bit more general. So we are interested in others. Yeah? Excuse me. Um, I thought uh, the other, does it mean that uh, can we study ourselves? That's exactly what I want to get away from. No, I don't want to start with myself. Yeah? I can start with myself and do introspection, but the focal point of qualitative is you, for me, different, other, yeah? And so I'm trying to bring your point of view, where you're coming from, why you just asked that question, well, yeah, into my understanding. I start from others, not from myself. I'm trying to observe, I'm trying to record uh, what is going on and work with that as data that I, as the researcher, am trying to better understand. Okay, so this is the starting point. I'm bringing in conceptions, biases, uh, yeah, that I may have, and hopefully in the process of working to a better understanding of the other person, my own biases, my own prejudice, my own preconceptions will become clearer to me. Okay. So I'm not starting with myself. And the reason is because I've seen people trying to do this, they get stuck with themselves. They are never turning to learn from the other. So the other is the expert. The other knows, supposedly, or does things that I don't understand. That's why I'm interested in others as others. From them, I want to be informed. I want to understand who they are, why they do what they do. Why do they wear what they wear? Why do they walk the way they walk? Okay. Uh, and in order to do this, I have to give up kind of my perspective and take their perspective. I use the metaphor, you step into their skin, yeah, at least in their shoes, and view the world from there. This way, I would better understand what is going on. So that is one of the core principles of doing qualitative work taking the viewpoint of the other, trying to move into it, trying to understand a particular illness, try to understand one of my colleagues in Switzerland, he is doing work with child molesters, yeah, trying to understand what is it that motivates grown-up men, in this case, to molest young children. Yeah? And this is not easy because on the one hand you don't want to step into their shoes. Yeah? But on the other hand you have to develop some kind of 
empathy in order to understand where are they coming from. Uh, I never met this, this other person who wrote a book on he interviewed and worked with rapists. Yeah, now that's even more, or just, I don't know, more or less. This is a very difficult thing to do, yeah, to understand what <coughs> others' experiences, yeah, a particular disease, um, a particular skill, something to work with moral exemplars, to understand why and how they, uh, what motivates them in their actions, that's a lot easier. Yeah. But again, it is something that we try to, to step into their shoes, to see the world from their perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're moving yourself kind of out of the limelight at the beginning and try to take the angle of the other, their point of view as the point of departure. Yeah. How do they make sense of whatever it is that you are interested in? Yeah. So that's the starting point. And as I mentioned in my last three words, that, that's not always easy. Um, okay, let's leave that there. The second one is contextual. Yeah. Because actions, people's actions, people do things in context. And it is only possible to understand what it is that they think, say, do, if people are put into a context. Yeah? If it is out of context, if it is abstract, we usually do a lot of guesswork. And we are also, in our interpretive work, highly abstract. But if we have contextual cues of what was going on before, what is following after, how was a particular action, a particular utterance, um, a particular concept possibly, although we can't see concepts unless they are on paper, how are they grounded in ongoing negotiation, usually conversation. Yeah. So the context becomes the unit of analysis, the situation within which, and typically in life situations, in vivo, not abstract situations in role play. Some people use role play in order to see what is going on. Um, and there are advantages, but there are very important disadvantages because they never model what is really happening in contexts. So this is where, and I tried to come up with these four, di four different types of, of uh, contexts. There's a historical context, first of all. Then there is a social and a cultural context. And then there is something that is much more narrow, the situational context. Yeah, so this is almost uh, from a larger context within which we share a lot of assumptions to a very specific context within which we do also share some assumptions because we share the situation. You know, we were in the situation together. Uh, but that's where misunderstandings are much more likely to pop up. Um, so what we are dealing with in this type of work, in uh, qualitative inquiry, is a highly unscripted and complex, unpredictable world. Now, that's what we are interested in. So we are not interested in taking people out of this highly complex world and put them into the lab situation and run experiments, because that's where we would uniform them. We would strip the context away yeah, and follow, make them follow particular conditions. Not that there is anything wrong with this, but those are very different ways of doing inquiry, doing research. And in our everyday world, we usually don't take others into a lab uh, and find out what they are thinking, but rather we read the contextual cues and say, whoa, is that really true? Or say, that is amazing. So there's a certain amount of trust. There's a certain amount of also uh, checking. Um, but 
there is no experimental and hypothesis testing that we usually in our everyday interactions uh, conduct. Um, so the other assumption that goes along with this is also that actions, behavior of people in vivo, in situations in life, um, they are not caused, they are not conditioned. Um, and not by external forces, so they are not caused by society or by, um, I, br I was brought up by, by my parents and that's why I became what I am. Um, so, uh, and sometimes society is being blamed for some people who say, well, you know, I did something bad and it was not my fault, it was society's fault. Um, so there is no assumption that there are these external factors that cause people to do what they do or think what they, what they think or say what they say. And we'll uh, return to that in the last conditions, people's agency. But they are also not caused by internal factors. So whenever we appeal to genetic factors or um, what other factors do we have? Uh, um, yeah, brain, uh, um, um, the, the brain as the organizer of people's uh, thinking, then those are uh, not sufficient uh, reasons for what people do, why they do what they do, why they say what they say. So we are thrown into the analysis of contextual situations within which behavior, people's actions take place. Okay? So the third important aspect of qualitative inquiry, and I mentioned that, is that people are different. They are different from one another. They are not the same. And that's what we make our focal point now, in uh, quantitative work, the focal point is much more what people share, what people bring, what, what it is that brings people together, so to speak. Yeah, up to the point that we are looking for universals, as in linguistic theory, there are a lot of researchers who assume that they, if they find what all people share in terms of language, that those are the most innate rules. Yeah, they believe in this assumption that those are the conditioners, those are the laws, so to speak, that lead to language and language potentially also to language use. In qualitative, we do not follow that idea at all. Yeah, we are interested in the differences, slight differences in dialect, slight differences in idiolects, how men and women speak differently, how people in different age groups speak, how the same person has changed his or her here language behavior over time. Those would be, could be the kinds of questions we are interested in. And that's also where we are interested in single cases, yeah, uh, following a particular speaker over time, or having a small group of speakers and see how they conduct their conversations, again, over time or in different situations. So all these differences yeah, that theoretical linguists find boring, find uninteresting, but that's exactly what qualitative inquirers are interested in and find potentially even fascinating. Yeah. How is this possible that a person in one situation thinks, speaks, and behaves this way, and an hour later, in a different situation, almost the opposite. Yeah, is there no coherence in this person? Does this person have an uh, identity flaw? Not at all, necessarily, could be. Yeah, but there is something that we need to explain by looking deeper, more fine-grained, going into the context. Okay. And that's where uh, these so-called differences between people become the center of the study, uh, bringing us much more away from larger generalizations into more fine-grained, deeper, single situations, sometimes going into a microanalysis of uh, mini-seconds or 
uh, many segments that conversation analysts, for instance, are interested in and conducting. Okay, so this would be the issue of difference. Now the last one, agency. And by the way, I mean, difference and agency are exactly the two kinds of aspects that I think it was in segment four, uh, when I tried to talk about identity, right? Uh, this is, it has to do with identity and identity analysis. Um, agency, qualitative inquiry, sees people as intentional meaning-making agents. Yeah? So again, they are not conditioned by whatever it is outside, and they are not conditioned or the insight is not causing them what they think, <coughs> do, and say. So this is leading the um, inquiry into the other, the other person as an agent who is most likely the expert in whatever it is that we are interested in whether it is illness, a particular illness that we're interested in, whether it is a particular experience, whatever. Yeah. So this is where um, the agency becomes one of the focal points for qualitative inquiry. So this is the slide in order to um, sum this up a little bit and relate it back to identity. Yeah. The formation and maintenance of identity how people, here the other, is maintaining a sense of who they are, a sense of self, yeah, and navigating also this, um, what I called in segment four, the direction of fit. On the one hand, we think of ourselves as the product of our world, parents, friends, etc. On the other hand, we have an impact on our parents, our children, our students, the world. Yeah? How we navigate this, these are issues of identity, of sense of self, and this is exactly captured in qualitative inquiry. So, in our interest in others, uh, in qualitative, bringing this to our students in a course, uh, we bring them into a situation where the goal is to learn from others. Okay? To inquire, to do research, if you want to, I like inquiry better, that helps us to better understand what is it that the other is doing, thinking, saying. And in doing so, in trying to open up to the other, the person who studies has to become more and more able to put one's own biases, one's own prejudice, if you want, but also the kind of ideas that you had at the very beginning on the back burner and learn what they are bringing into the world of the learner. Okay, so this is the type of inquiry that leads or that lends itself for the transformation of the learner. Yeah. So this was the original goal. What is it that we can do with our learners differently so that we have more of an engagement and more of a productive learning process? This is the link that I wanted to establish between the processes in section, in segment six, and qualitative in segment seven. Both nicely linked together as a way to help our students to become more engaged with real world challenges, to connect classroom and world, others, to manage complexity and uncertainty, very different from experimental work. work and also develop habits of lifelong learning. So this is where segment six and segment seven hook up with one another. And with segment eight, in our next meeting, I will try to demonstrate this. 
Yeah, because so far I've been relatively, or let's put it this way, very abstract. And then in the next segment, I will give pieces from classes that I conduct and work with these pieces, through these pieces, and demonstrate what I've been trying to tell you so far. Thank you.